In March 1940, Britain was under serious threat, but not from bombs or tanks. The real danger came from something far more quiet and deadly, ships vanishing in the cold waters of the Atlantic. Every week, convoys left North America carrying food, fuel, medicine, and raw materials needed to keep Britain going. But each week, fewer of those ships returned. In just the first four months of 1940, German submarines, U-boats, sank over 250 Allied ships. That wasn't just a number. It meant thousands of tons of supplies lost, factories without fuel, and sailors who would never return home. Britain depended on imported goods, needing about 55 million tons a year just to survive. The country only grew around a third of its own food. If the supply convoy stopped, people would starve within months. Admiral Karl Donitz, in charge of Germany's U-boat fleet, had a clear plan. He developed a group attack strategy known as the Wolf Pack. Submarines hunted together and launched coordinated attacks, usually at night when they were harder to detect. British sonar couldn't find them in the dark, and a single torpedo could destroy a huge cargo ship in minutes. Most sailors barely had time to escape before the freezing water pulled them under. Every convoy commander had to make tough calls. Should they move faster and risk leaving slower ships behind? Should they zigzag to avoid torpedoes, knowing it use up fuel? Or should they stay in a tight group for protection, even if it made them an easier target? Every choice could mean lives lost. Winston Churchill, who became Prime Minister in May 1940, later admitted the U-boat threat was the only thing during the war that truly scared him. Think about that, not the bombings, not the Nazi invasion, but submarines lurking underwater. By spring, the situation was dire. British merchant ships were being destroyed faster than new ones could be built. The Royal Navy was stretched thin, trying to protect convoys, hunt U-boats, and defend the home islands all at once. Warship crews were exhausted, racing from one mission to the next. Some convoys had just one or two escorts for dozens of cargo ships. Meanwhile, the German subs grew more aggressive. They shared intelligence and worked in teams. One submarine might track a convoy during the day and call on others by night. Then, several would attack together, making it almost impossible for the Allies to defend. British sailors started calling this time the Happy Time, but that was a German nickname. For the U-boat crews, it was easy pickings. For the Allies, it was a disaster. And U-boats weren't the only problem. While the British focused on the submarine threat, a new danger was quietly spreading. One that didn't move in groups, didn't need a crew, and didn't give any warning. On November 21, 1939, the British destroyer HMS Gypsy was moving to the Thames estuary, right off the coast of England. It wasn't enemy territory. This was home, and the waters had already been swept for mines. Then, without warning, the ship exploded and sank. No torpedoes, no sign of a submarine, just a sudden blast. A few days later, it happened again. A merchant ship blew up in the same area. Then another, and another. Ships were being destroyed in rivers, harbors, and near the coast. Places that should have been completely safe. The explosions were massive, ripping ships apart and killing crews instantly. By early December, more than a dozen ships had gone down in British waters, and nobody knew why. These weren't submarine attacks, and minesweepers hadn't found anything unusual. Ships were simply vanishing in explosions, no warning, no enemy in sight. Even experienced captains who had faced submarines without blinking were now afraid to dock a home. At least with you boats, you could take precautions. But this new threat? It was like fighting an invisible force. The Thames estuary earned a new nickname, the Death Trap. In December, the losses kept climbing. Even a massive battleship, HMS Nelson, was nearly destroyed after hitting something off the coast of Scotland. If battleships weren't safe, nothing was. Then finally, a clue. On November 23, 1939, just two days after HMS Gypsy sank, a German plane was spotted dropping something into the mud flats near Schubereness. When the tide went out, British bomb experts moved in to check it out. What they found changed everything. It was a mine, but not one the Royal Navy had seen before. It didn't have the usual spikes or contact points. It just sat there, looking harmless. 
Lieutenant Commander John Overy and his team carefully studied it. Knowing one wrong move could kill them all, they worked quickly as the tide rolled in, racing against time. Inside, they found surprise, a magnetic sensor. This mine didn't need to be touched. It could detect a magnetic field from a passing ship and detonate just from that. That explained everything. The safe zones that weren't safe, the mine sweepers that passed over them without sending them off. Britain was now fighting a weapon that turned every ship's own metal hull into a trigger. The recovered mine was sent to an unlikely person, a Canadian chemistry professor named Charles Gadeve. He wasn't a naval officer or an engineer. He'd been in Britain on a research fellowship when the war broke out and ended up helping with unusual military projects. In late 1939, the Navy formed the Department of Miscellaneous Weapons Development, a group for strange ideas and the people behind them. Gadeve fit right in. When the magnetic mine problem reached his desk, others were thinking about traditional solutions. Stronger armor, better mine detection, more careful mapping. Khadiv saw it differently. This wasn't a naval problem. It was a science problem. He knew that steel ships naturally become magnetized during construction as the metal lines up with Earth's magnetic field. That magnetic signature stays with a ship for life. And that's what the mines were reacting to. His idea? Neutralize that magnetic signature. He proposed wrapping ships in coils of electrical wire and running a current through them to cancel out the ship's magnetic field. It sounded wild, like turning ships into floating electromagnets. Naval officers didn't take him seriously at first. Some laughed. One even asked if he was drunk. But Gadeev had the science and math to prove it could work. He explained that every magnetic field has a direction, north and south. If you create an equal and opposite field, the two cancel each other out. It's like how noise-canceling headphones block out sound. Except here, the ship will become invisible to magnetic mines. No one had ever tried it on a full-size warship, but Charles Gadee wanted to degauss every vessel in the British fleet, from destroyers to trawlers. Each needed precise calculations and thousands of feet of copper cable. The goal, cancel the magnetic field that triggered German sea mines. The science was simple, but the challenge was huge. Steel ships built on Earth's surface naturally became magnetized. That invisible signature could be detected by magnetic mines resting on the seafloor. The solution? Wrap the hull in electrical cable and run a current to mass the ship's field. It worked. Khadiv's team tested on HMS Hebe in 1940 and reduced its signature by 90%. But proving it once wasn't enough. Britain had over 9,000 merchant ships and hundreds of naval vessels. Installing degaussing coils required specialized workers and a constant supply of copper, already in short demand. Mistakes could ruin the system or leave ships unprotected. Khadiv didn't just solve the physics problem. He built a nationwide response. Degaussing stations sprang up in major ports like Liverpool and Portsmouth. Crews worked nonstop, often during bombing raids, to install the systems and test each ship. When full installations took too long, Gadeev's team created wiping stations, quick fixes using shore-based magnets to neutralize fields temporarily. By summer 1940, 3,000 workers were involved. By mid-1941, over 10,000 ships had been degaussed. Canada, the U.S., and other Allied ports joined in. Germany's magnetic mine advantage collapsed. In early 1940, mines had damaged or sunk over 100 ships. By 1941, that number dropped to under 20. But U-boats still prowled the Atlantic. Torpedoes didn't care if a ship was degaussed or not. Still, this effort gave Allied ships one big win. Peace of mind. Ports were safer. Convoys could focus on submarine threats. Morale rose. Sailors no longer feared sudden explosions near home. Khadiv's idea, once mocked, became standard. New ships came fitted with degaussing coils. The work went on quietly, without glory. No medals. No monuments. Just results. Today, every navy in the world still uses the principles Khadiv applied. He showed that science, not tradition, could turn the tide of war. Sometimes, the most unlikely person, with the most unlikely idea, makes all the difference. Khadiv's work wasn't just a wartime fix. 
It set a new standard for how science and military innovation could intersect. His degaussing method didn't just save ships. It saved lives, protected supply chains, and kept Britain to fight during its darkest hours. The success of the program proved that unconventional thinking, backed by solid science, could outpace even the most sophisticated enemy weapons. Today, navies worldwide still rely on variations of the same principles he pioneered. Though he never sought fame, Khedive's legacy lives on, not in statues, but in every ship that sails safely past unseen threats beneath the waves.